Yes, colleagues, delegates, it's great to be here in person. The Department for Education is only around the corner. It's only a couple of minutes, so I wouldn't have missed it for the world, and neither should anybody else. Um, and such a really good um, uh, conference agenda um, for, the, uh, for the day. It looks really, really strong. Um, so thank you for having me here today. My name is Rachel D'Souza. As Children's Commissioner, it's my job to protect and promote the rights of children in this country and to bring their voices to the heart of government. This applies to all children in England, but I also have responsibilities um, for reserved issues to UK Parliament for all children across the UK. Um, and I have a particular duty, which is why, why I really wanted to be here today, to those children with a social worker or those children living away from home. Um, as Children's Commissioner, what I've got a few kind of superpowers. One of them is to enter anywhere there is a child um, in the public sector. One is to demand data from any public body. I do it regularly. I'm constantly on the Home Office's case about data on asylum-seeking children. Um, so I, I, and you know, I work with LAs, we get data from there, so to demand data. And the other is to demand a response uh, from anyone who's looking after children. So I use that power of entry wherever children are living in institutions and I spend a good deal of time and so do my wonderful team um, in secure settings such as young offenders institutions. I talk to the boys, mainly boys as we know and sometimes girls who are at the most acute end of the group we're thinking about today and I'm always struck by just how differently their lives could have gone. Yeah, I was in Felton recently and asked all the boys when were you last happy at school? Um, year five, year six. You know, and, and it's always the same. When were you last happy at school? And actually, when I ask them what their plans for the future are, many of them serving 15, 20 years, they're going to go into adults. The plans for the future are, it's often education, try and get a job. Um, and you just think of when were those intervention points. I listened to, I was, I was recently in a, in a Young Offenders Institute and looking at education and I got locked into the uh, education room with three boys. Um, it's always a bit of a moment that, isn't it? Um, and I said to them, well, what do you like to do? I thought, what else can I do? What do you like to do in education? And they said, oh, sing. We like to sing, we like music. So I said, okay, what do you like to sing? And there was some sheet music of Adele's Someone Like You. So we just stood up and sung can you do and the governor came running in like what on earth is going on but it was it was an important moment um i was struck by the absurd and tragic waste why were they here when with the right help they could have been somewhere else pursuing their dreams of performing because that was what they wanted to do so i'm very excited to be in this room with a room full of people thinking about what more we can do to help these children so when I started as Children's Commissioner in 2021, um, it feels like an aeon ago, it was three years ago, three years ago on March the 1st, I launched the Big Ask. We were just coming out of lockdown um, and I wanted to know what children needed to thrive, what they wanted for their futures. And I heard from over half a million children making it the largest survey of its kind across the world. I heard about their worries, their struggles, as well as their hopes for the future at a time for much, you know, of much uncertainty. If I was going to characterise it, I'd say... Children, wherever they were, talked to me about was anxiety, mental health concerns. That was one of the biggest themes. Worries about isolation. It really had impacted on them. And then getting back to school, getting back to catch up, trying to get their lives on track. Um, I never forget the littlest ones just talking about being able to play in their local park again. Um, I decided with an election on the horizon this year, I decided it was the perfect time to go out again and speak to the children of England. So I did. Um, so we've been out asking children what they want for the next from the next government, what they want for children. So last September, I launched the Big Ambition Survey uh, for children and young people. What do they want to tell the next prime minister and government? And we will be going out with this on Monday. If any of you are around Westminster, the children are taking over Parliament on Monday afternoon and they're going to be telling government exactly what it is that they want from them. Um, 
I wanted to know what they, they want us all to know and to do for them. And the response to the survey was overwhelming. So over 360,000 responses from, from children, and I'll be publishing this next week. It felt very different out there this year. I went from Grimsby to Scunthorpe to Liverpool to Newcastle to Exeter to Plymouth. I went to, spoke to every child. I got response from every child in, in YOIs. So we've got a fantastic data set there. We went to secure mental health wards, which is where children are the most unhappy. Um, and we went, we went everywhere and talked talk to young people. Now, if we add up all the surveys, the work we've done, engaging children, we've now spoken to a million children. Um, we spoke to 14,000 children with a social worker this time. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all the professionals here today who helped us get that survey out to children and ensure their voices were heard. It means a great deal. It means a great deal to me, but it also means a great deal to the children who are, who are absolutely like, um, I, I think one of the things they feel most strongly about is that they've done this and they want a response. They want to hear back. They want to see it. So, I mean, for them, I think it's, it's really, really important. As I say, the findings will be on, uh, published on Monday, but I've been struck by the way children across the country have spoken about violence and their fears of violence. Look, it wasn't just in Liverpool that the kids talked to me about worries about knife crime. It was in Amersham. It was in Exeter. The perception of violence and the experience of violence, but the perception of violence, the perception of knife crime is absolutely ubiquitous. It's quite interesting. Um, far, the fears of violence online and offline much more talked about that much, far more frequently than they did in 2021. Um, they also talked about health and concerns about uh, not being able to access health properly, all which will impact on the, on the children that, that we talk about. So many kids talk to me about, you know, you have to pay for a GP now. They're getting this, wherever they're getting it, they're getting this into, it's in their heads. There wasn't one child I spoke to right across the country who didn't say, uh, when I asked the question, you know, about money, everyone talked about their parents being worried about the cost of food. It was, it was everywhere. And that's really markedly different from 2021. Um, you won't find a lot of that in our report from 21 because it wasn't there in what the children said, even though the issues were there. It feels in just two, two and a half, three years, really quite different. Um, but back to the safety issue. I recently held a round table on safety with two of my amazing youth ambassadors. I've got 16 of them. They're from all over the country, all different backgrounds. Both of them spoke and it surprised us they both spoke about how schools in their area completely different areas had faced lockdowns because of threats from gangs and that this was becoming a norm we were all surprised i had um you know that, that yeah yeah this they you know they call up and they lock the school down so it's no wonder there are perceptions and fears in children's minds if they're experiencing those sorts of things um Whilst most children are safe and will never be involved in violence, there are clearly a group of children who are deeply worried and we need to do more to address their worries. And that's why I'm excited today about the focus on parenting and parental involvement. Now I'm gonna talk about the specific areas of work on children's social care, school attendance, interactions with the police, where I think these issues of keeping children safe and involving parents are deeply intertwined. But I wanted to start by speaking a little bit about why it's so important that we always start by thinking family. So a year ago, I carried out my independent review on family for government, and I wanted to dig deeper into what family meant. We may all instinctively feel the importance of a loving, caring family, but our research translated into hard and fast evidence. Children who reported a closer relationship with their parents at age 13 had higher earnings at 25 and outcomes in general were far stronger. It turns out the boy who told me a loving family is worth more than money and will give you guidance, support, love and advice was exactly right. And yet too often our services are not set up to support this protective effect that family in all its forms. There wasn't one adult or child who said this is what a family must look like. Um, children talk to me about their parents, their carers, their grandmas, their granddads, their football coach, their dog, the lady up the road who you've got so much respect for, you call her auntie. Family was a broad church. It wasn't a census data pinpoint, but it was deeply, deeply important to children. 
especially when, if you look into look at my family review, we we analyse the um, millennial cohort of children and realise that you know about forty four percent of them, uh, that millennial cohort, did not grow up with both parents. And again, you don't see that that kind of movement and change and lack of stability in children's lives sometimes from census data. Um, it was quite a shocker that one. So by getting the I, I mean we, we too often so as I say too often our services are not set up to support the protective effects of family. It's so important and we need to understand family in the round. So that if an adult is facing difficulties with mental health, finances or other issues, the impact on a child is considered um, and support is provided. And likewise, if a child is struggling, um, as so many are with getting back to school at the moment, the parent also <coughs> feels involved and included. Now, by getting support for family right, we'll get so many other things right too. And again, in my big S survey, I found that although only 6% of children reported being unhappy with their family life, these children were nine times more likely to be unhappy with all aspects of their life and their life overall. Now, the vital importance of families come through just as strongly in the Big Ambition Survey, and particularly around how any strain and difficulties um, felt by parents is absorbed by children. Gosh, that's, I think that's one of the key messages, how much children are absorbing the anxiety that the adults are feeling, whether it's in the home, whether it's online or around, it's really very, very stark when you talk to children and very different over this past couple of years. And particularly how any, yeah, the number of children talking to me about cost of living makes this abundantly clear. Um, and, it's, and again, feels quite different. We also asked in The Big Ambition whether children got to spend enough time with their parents. And I was struck by how older teenagers were the least likely to agree um, and they, most wanted it even though they themselves were really conscious of the fact that when mum asks how you are or you know you just go oh but they were like keep asking you know keep asking and I think there's some really strong strong messages there um, <laughs> parents clearly matter and carers clearly matter throughout a child's life now I've spoken about the importance of tackling involvement in violence and I've spoken about the importance of taking a whole family approach so I want to talk about some specific areas now where I think these things come together and some of the work that we've done so children's social care on children's social care first we know that last year child criminal exploitation was identified as an issue in over 14,000 children's social care assessments sexual exploitation was identified in over 15,000 and gangs in 11,000 there have been huge strides made in contextual safeguarding, thanks in no small part to some of the speakers you're going to be hearing from later today, such as Professor Furman. And I've met some fantastic teams like the Empower You team in Birmingham doing brilliant work, often jointly with the VRUs. But my team remember vividly the virtual, uh, and I do, the virtual reality game on criminal exploitation we were shown by West Midlands VRU. I'm afraid to say, uh, my team immediately took the chance to become virtual criminals, but we'll say less about that. Uh, but it was such a powerful, um, powerful experience. But fundamentally, we're all still operating in a system framed around the harms um, of course by parents, which leaves us in a very challenging situation. When I speak to social workers and parents, I'm so often told it's the parents whose children have been drawn into crime, or crucially perhaps where they think it might be beginning, who are the ones actively seeking out um, involvement from social care, but finding that their child doesn't quite fit or doesn't quite meet the threshold. We recently carried out some work looking at the variation in use of child in need plans around the country, which revealed to me just how little is known or understood about these children. We found 10 to 15 year olds are more likely than other children involved with children's social care to be on a child in need plan, although the reasons why are hard to unpick. We found the length of a plan varies from just over a month to just over a year, again with very little understanding of why. And we found the rate of children on child in need plans is 10 times higher in some parts of the country than others. And it's not possible, as data is currently recorded, to say whether a child in need plan is closed because things have actually improved for the child. We just don't know. Um, I'm hoping I'm speaking to an audience of the converted when I say it seems clear to me that we need to get much better at understanding what's going on for these children, what intervention they're getting for which difficulties and which are working. 
but I also want to see significant changes to way the way the system operates with a statutory duty for early help, which can step in when parents are still receptive to the idea, the idea of help and stops them having to prove that things are bad enough to get help. And I want more consistent thresholds for social care interventions so parents and children can be sure of getting help if things do escalate because we need to better serve those children but also because parents who are telling us that something's going wrong for their child want and need our help. So to move to attendance, now I am obsessed with attendance. You'll all have heard the big figures, 1.8 million children are about persistently absent, that means missing like one day a fortnight and we've got about 140,000 children <coughs> severely absent um, which means missing 50% or more of their time um, which is you know, deeply significant. That severely absent group only have a 5% chance of getting their outcomes, you know, five, good, five good grades at the end of, end of school. They're more likely to be neat. They're more likely to fall into problems. It's a huge problem. We need children in school because you know, school is safeguarding them and they're, they're, let alone their desire for better opportunities in the future. Now, the involvement of parents is equally important when it comes to the attendance issue. I mean, going back to the children I speak in YOIs, as I said, I always ask them when, when they were last happy in school. And tragically, they almost always tell me that it was year five or six. So for those who are not that familiar, that's like 10 or 11, 10 or 11 years old. I mean, when we think about diversion, if we haven't done it by then, um, you know, we've got, we, we're in trouble, aren't we? If that's when they were last happy in school and that's when things were last going fine. We all know the well-trodden links between exclusion and involvement in violence, but I want to think much more broadly about children's relationships with school, how we go about resetting it. And I believe that attendance has become one of the greatest issues of our time. School absent, absent rates have become entrenched. I started calling the alarm on this in the first few weeks back from lockdown. And I was pushed back for years uh, by, the, you know, by the Department for Education who were like, it's okay, it's all going to be fine, and uh, you know, about 90% 90, 90 is fine. You know, there's tens and thousands, tens and tens and tens of thousands of children, and it's not fine, and it's not getting better. Um, and it's going to take an awful lot more um, to get the kids back, and it is a very complex issue. You've got everything from that kind of social contract of why should I have to go to school when there are every day when there are so many bank holidays and you know they closed our schools and you know we're, we're from nice homes but I'm just not that bothered there's that kind of absence which needs one approach there's the children with mental health issues anxiety issues anxiety issues about school that are living with those um, from lockdown and I bet you know have got friends um, who've got children who are not back for that reason. I mean, I, I, I pretty much every adult I meet will tell me um, you know, about concerns here. We've got children in the special educational needs bucket um, who really just haven't gone back because their needs aren't been met. In 2021, children, SEND children, were far happier with their education than they are now. Um, so the responses we've got are like, it's, they're just not as happy. But then there is that bucket of children, I call buckets my three buckets, but that group of children who've just gone, they're not, they're, they've just not come back, they are, goodness knows what, what's happening, and they are on the streets and at risk um, of becoming known to the authorities for all the wrong reasons. So we've got deep, deep concerns. School attendance is clearly linked to academic achievement and later life success. I published research recently that showed, I just took last year's data, got hold of it, um, used my uh, powers to get hold of it, and analyzed who gets five good GCSEs. Basically, if you're persistently absent, you're far less likely to get it, about 38% of them get it, as opposed to 78%, and only 5% of severely absent children reach the milestone. Um, and it's children from most disadvantaged areas, and it's children who then are not going to progress to where they need to be. We know this. We know it's, it's, it's uh, 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 just a, a really difficult outcome um, that, that's a hangover from lockdown and needs addressing. But it's about so much more than attainment in pure academic terms. A school can be a place of safety, a place to build relationships with trusted adults, a place where emerging issues can be identified. And I'm constantly talking to my head teacher colleagues about this. Over the past 
20 years there's been a major education reform program right and attainment between the haves and the haves not was narrowing until 2017. In 2017 that gap started widening again and it's blown apart um, since lockdown but it wasn't just lockdown it was it was it was widening anyway and you have to when I look at it all I mean my thesis is basically the neglect of children's social care the neglect of funding to services around children and if we are going to try to narrow that gap again, then that is where the recovery plan needs to be. That's where the funding needs to be. And it's the wrapping around the child uh, that, that where that needs to happen. And I think it's a massive challenge for us. It's not one that we could have necessarily realised or known or realised how difficult it was going to get. But it's there and we can't ignore it. Um, and we can't be islands anymore. Schools can't be islands. You know, they've, they've got to be uh, working hand in hand with health, with social care, with justice. Many are, but, all, but, but I think we, we in local areas need to be doing this so much better. We're not going to solve the attendance problems if we don't, um, let alone um, attainment issues. So this summer I conducted roundtables in areas with some of the most challenging attendance rates. I was in Croydon, parts of Kensington, Hull and Birmingham. Um, where there had been success, school leaders said they'd obsessed over attendance, but so did public health, and so did the ICB members, and so did you know the children's hospitals, and so did it became everybody's job. Um, and the, and um, teachers told me how building the relationships with parents and families was actually crucial for getting children back. In many cases, the solutions on attendance do lie beyond the school gates, and that's why we need to see attendance as everyone's business. It is far better for everyone in this room if the children are in school. It's far better for, for the work that we do. It just is. Um, everyone, as long as the school is the right place, it's welcoming. And actually, some of the feedback I've had from the big children in the Big Ambition, only, only I'm... I'm my, my uh, this is going out Monday, but getting it in advance, only 60% of them say they enjoy school. Um, there are some real challenges about what we're actually doing, the wider, it, and, and as you get older, you see it drop off. Um, you know, so whilst the kids are telling us from all backgrounds that they know they need to do their maths and their English, and they know they need to be rules, but they also want a wider curriculum. They want fun. They want the activities, they want the sport, they want to do that. And, and it's, it's coming across loud and clear, and, and I think we need to listen to them. Um, everyone involved with the care of children, I think, needs to be part of supporting children's attendance. Schools, local authorities, children's services, community groups, we all have a duty to support children who are struggling in school, and it's good for all of us if they're back. That's my basic thesis. And finally, I wanted to turn to policing. There are countless things we could talk about when it comes to relationships between children, their communities and their police. And, you know, I'm always overwhelmed by, you know, wherever I go and we have these conversations, children really want the police. They know the police have to do some difficult jobs. They want the police to keep them safe. Um, they want to be able to trust them. And it, and it comes across really, really strongly. And those relationships are so important. And I'm so pleased we've got these colleagues here today. I, I want to focus on just one of... The most contentious police powers, namely strip searching. So last year, basically, I met Child Q and her family and promised her, because she'd been told that she'd been the only child strip searched in school. And so I promised her I'd check whether that was true. Um, so I used my powers to check whether that was true with the Met Police, working completely collaboratively with them. And I was so shocked by what I saw, um, you know, both about the number of strip searches, but also where it had happened, that I felt I had to look right across the country. And all police authorities collaborated, gave us their data. Um, and it was really <coughs> difficult. We had children, you know, there, there were examples. There, first of all, the data wasn't collected as well as it should have been. And I know that that is doing so much better. But we, there were children strip searched by police of the wrong um, Gender. There were children strip searched in places they shouldn't have been. Um, you know, re really difficult. It was really, really difficult material, and you'll have seen it because we had a big media round on it. 
but it actually has moved the Home Office, which goes to show if you do really shine a light on the data, you can actually make the changes. So never hold back from it. We are, it takes time, but we are getting the changes through. And I went back to Hackney recently, and not one child has been strip searched since we were last there. So we can make changes. Um, now we know that sometimes a parent's called and they don't come to the station, but sometimes they're asked because the police decide, uh, they're not asked because the police decide rightly or wrongly the search is too urgent. What must it do to a parent's relationship with the police to know their child was subjected to such an invasive procedure without them there to make sure the child was safe? And I do deeply understand how difficult situations can be, but we must take a safeguarding first approach when it's children. My research included a case study of a boy whose parents never found out he'd been strip searched multiple times until they were at home talking about the child Q case in the news. All of this should be combined with the racial disproportionality of, of searches. Black children were six times more likely to be searched when compared to other children. Not only must children always be treated fairly and with respect, but parents have to be able to have the right to tr uh, have to be able to trust that their children will be treated fairly and with respect. Parents have to be confident the system is genuinely there to help their child and not not to criminalise them. Um, the, the, police, the, the police commissioners in all the authorities are working together to, to make improvements here. And again, I just say, when you see something like that, calling it out and doing it effectively and collaboratively can be incredibly helpful. We can make change, and this is an area where we are making change. Now, I realise I've covered a lot of ground, but I just want to leave you with a quote from a 16-year-old girl who sums up in a sentence what I've taken minutes to say. The government should invest in more enrichment activities and most of all invest in facilities to help young people who are less fortunate and have turned to crime and work with social workers to find the root of their issues rather than blaming young people who have deep-seated issues and problems with authority and arresting them just to release them without much of a warning or reason not to reoffend. In her own words, there we go. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening.